Hi, this is your host Sapin Bhartia and welcome to another episode of TFI Let's Talk. And today we have with us two guests, Grace Andrews, Principal Product Evangelist at Equinix Metal and Adam Bosniak, Founder and CTO of Akash Network. Grace, Adam, it's great to have you both on the show. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having me. We have uh, covered Akash before, so our audience, they do know what you folks do, but it's another opportunity. Let's talk about, you know, what do you folks do? Yeah, so Akash is a decentralized cloud platform. Um, you can think of it as like Airbnb for compute. So we're a single platform to access many, many different uh, data centers around the world. So we're an alternative to some of the, the big cloud services that are owned by one person. We, get, we, allow, we give people access to any number of data centers that are more difficult to access without uh, without going through Akash. And today's discussion is around Web3. Grace, I would like to hear your take on it. How would you define it? Yikes. Um, I like that guy got that first. Well, I think if we think about what Web3 is, it's really, for me, part philosophical and also part architectural. Um, the philosophy being a decentralized nature within your systems running with consensus and protocols. The hard bits of it or the hardware of it means that you no longer have, you know, traditional dedicated servers and systems that sometimes lie stagnant, not necessarily doing work because that's what you need in order to have this website available or in order to allow your customers to access something that lives on your part of the web. And I think the thing about Web3 that's really interesting is it's a conversation still about is it architecture versus is it new architecture versus old architecture or is it the way in which we utilize the architecture? So I see Web3 as definitely being multi-cloud. It's flexible. It doesn't have the same sort of tenants that the web one and web 2.0 had, which were being built on very particular, more stringent protocols. There's a lot of flexibility and a lot of the underlying technology here is air quotes, but not to like be derivative, but blockchain. And so the question of what blockchain is, how you do the work, prove the work, stake the work, and who validates the work is all a conversation that has to be had in order to say that something is web 3.0 or not. Can you also talk about Web3 from the perspective of the kind of world that we live in? It's very decentralized. It's not just multi-cloud. It's multi-clouds at the edge. Yeah, I think that the world we live in now has been moving towards this place of, air quotes, the edge, right? And what I mean by that is when Web 1.0 was created, did we have smart houses? Did we have smart appliances? Did we have, for instance, I drive a car that's a hybrid that can tell me all number of things about the conversion of the gasoline to the electric battery that exists right next to the traditional engine, right? And then we also have these concepts of devices, wearable devices. I wear a smartwatch. Other people have smart watches, you know, they even, you even have smart jewelry. You have rings that can tell you how many steps you take that plug it up to the cloud and then gives you your trends for the last week, your last month, your last year. And so I think that when we talk about this new internet, this cloud, right, the cloud is ubiquitous, but what is it really? Traditionally, the cloud has still had to be married with a physical data center. It's still, you know, the cloud might seem ambiguous, but it still connects to hardware and software that has traditionally taken up space. It's been an actual server farm. It's been an actual data center. You could walk into, see the racks, see the cables. And now we're in a world where in order to keep up with the demand for this ephemeral state of existence, where we're sending data and information somewhere continuously, we've had to convert a lot of our systems to these virtualized environments in order to maximize the physical hardware that still powers everything at the end of the day. And so I think that when we think about Web 3.0, that's a big thing. It, will we ever get to a place where everything is 100% virtualized? I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball that lets me see into the digital future. But what I will say is right now it's about optimization, whether it's of cost of, you know, of systems, we don't want to have wasted space the, you know, now the cloud is the new like land and everyone wants their piece of it. And then on that piece, they want to build high rise condominiums and not huge mansions because they want as much as possible to be able to, you know, take place on that little piece that they might have. How would you define Web3 purely? 
from technological perspective, it could mean different things to different people. We are still trying to kind of define it. Yeah, I mean, as you say, I think Web3 is a lot of different things to different people. Um, but I think one of the underlying things that many people kind of keep have in mind when they think of Web3 is a people giving people the option to, to use the, the, the technology that they want to use and be transparency. And so for Akash ourselves, like we give people the option to use data centers that are outside of the norm. Like it's really easy for people to go on and use AWS now, for instance, or some of the other big clouds. And it's just simply not, there's a lot more friction when you try to use some of these other options. So Akash is about reducing that friction and making it easier to give for people to choose not to use some of these big centralized um, behemoths in this space. Also transparency, our, our pricing, our, our auction, everything is transparent. So it allows people, it makes a, a fair playing field for everybody to really understand what pricing is like uh, for, for these services. And really like talking about Web3s, people say, oh, every, the underlying infrastructure is all centralized anyways, this is all BS. Well, you know, there are a lot of projects like ours that aim to, you know, improve, like expand the amount of options that people have for deploying their infrastructure onto high quality data centers like Equinix, for instance, um, to really solve that problem. Adam, why you chose Equinix when there are other players in the market? Yeah, so with our system, you know, we support a very wide range of servers, let's say, from, from companies that have purchased racks for their own internal processing to, you know, being in this space like Equinix. And so we do support a range, but we wanted to initially launch with somebody like Equinix just to showcase that you can get high quality, performant, um, stable systems for a really good price through our system. So they're, they're a really good showcase for us. Um, and also, you know, as we were launching the system, we wanted a reliable system for ourselves to be able to run this on and, and uh, Equinix was uh, just like the best choice we could go with. What kind of unique challenges companies like Akash bring to you as they offer Web3 experience to their customers? How do you satisfy their needs? Yeah, I think that Adam really hit home on what the benefits of Equinix Metal really are, right? And a big piece of that puzzle is availability in different geos. And one of the things that we do very well, I'm biased, obviously, but one of the things that we do very well is we have a large coverage area. We really support many geos all across the globe. And so for companies who don't want to necessarily be tied to a single cloud provider or who do have multi-cloud providers that they leverage, we give that flexibility. We don't care. You know, I like to say that we are agnostic. We don't care if you're coming to us from AWS. We don't care if you're using Google Cloud. We we don't mind. All, all things are available and we have so many integrations that support as, as many tools as possible, including some of the bigger players in the space, right? If we think of, you know, the Dells or the Nutanix, but we also support smaller vendors as well. And so that flexibility, especially for people building Web3 solutions, people who need that kind of model in order to decide, well, what it tool is best for what needs to be done because that's a tenement of Web3 is it's not rigid. We want to be able to provide that flexibility and for it to be continuously supported. And I think that that's the biggest gain that people who are building solutions of all kinds, but especially Web3 gain when they utilize tools like Equinix Metal. No Web3 discussion is complete without 5G, which is much more than what we access on our smartphones. It allows for private networks and so much more. What role do you think 5G is playing in Web3? I mean, I think that when we talk about 5G, it makes me really want to talk about platform Equinix as opposed to just metal, right? On platform Equinix, we've got fabric, we've got interconnection, we've got smart key. We've got a lot of different tools that are part of our edge offering and the proximity to the edge is actually what allows for it to be not only dynamic in your environment, but fast. And so being able to work within those tool sets with speed allows people to do the work that needs to be done. An example that I always think of that I didn't realize until a customer told me is how important it is for all time servers to be synced when they're doing blockchain protocols. And they're like, we wanna know what transaction came in first or what miner did what work at what time, and it has to be precise. It can't be 
a millisecond off. And I don't necessarily, me as a person and me as a technician, I don't think of that because that's not my in, like intuitive working space. And so when they said that, I thought, oh, here is an example of why being as close to the edge as, as possible matters because in the turnaround time of your work, isn't there's no latency here. And so I think what 5G will do is decrease the latency that we sometimes see in some of the processes and protocols that people are running in order to do more efficient work and a lot of what platform Equinix is trying to do is push as close to the edge as possible with our offering so that we can support edge solutions that our customers would be building. I was just going to say, you know, bringing back to your original description of like, what is the cloud? What is this thing? So much is being uploaded into the cloud now. That was quite ridiculous. But, and uh, that is true. And I think that with edge compute, it's going to be even more true. So in your case of like driving cars and things like that, it's, it can easily offload these applications to the edge. And with Zakash and with Equinix Metal, you know, our pairing, what, what our vision is, is to, to open that space up for people, for individuals and small companies to innovate and be have access to that um, so that uh, it's not just like the big players that are able to, uh, to exploit that the new uh, space that, that's opening up. Let's talk about security, which has become a very hot topic given the current geopolitical situation in Europe. Where is security in Web3? Is it still an afterthought like traditional infrastructure or is taken more seriously in Web3 world? Security is a complicated question, not to give like a political you know, statement there, but the way that we're really looking at it, not just Metal, but also Platform Equinix, is what are security safeguards that we can build in to the way that we work with our customers, right? And so a lot of that comes to networking security, we really do offer a lot of various ways to secure your network in order to make sure that the people who are supposed to be on it are on it and the people who are not are not. And that's one of the things that we really extend into the platform Equinix space from the metal space to our customers. And I think another thing we really recommend is understanding automation, right? One of the things about security that I have learned over the course of my career is bad things are gonna happen. And it's really a question about having a protocol for action when things go wrong. I'm not saying be loose and free, right? And just have everything accessible, but things do go awry. And so something that we really recommend for our customers and we try to support them through is a disaster recovery plan, leveraging Equinix Metal as the foundation of this plan. And so how can you actually have everything you need to fail over should you need to, right? Can you have availability in a region or a zone that is under attack? Can you now bring up that server? Can you now also have that database and that data store up and ready to go? Can you connect it to the network that it needs to be on? Can you access all the things that you need to access so that there is not a lag in offering for your end user? And so really creating a tight disaster recovery plan that's leveraging automation so that we can help you automate this process and you can have these builds up and running should crisis occur is really one of the philosophies of security that we like to think of at the beginning as you architect your solution as opposed for, to it being an afterthought of when something goes wrong. Yeah, I would say that um, I think that, you know, as this notion of like the cloud being this ubiquitous thing running on many different servers comes to the forefront of our thinking, it, it actually is exposing all these holes and in, in how we used to think about the cloud. As you say, it was an afterthought before. Now, maybe it's more at the forefront because you're like, whoa, I don't know where this thing is going. Uh, but really, those same challenges were present before. We just weren't thinking about them. So it's a bit of a forcing function. Um, and I think it's a good thing. Um, so there are, because of, I think because of that forcing function, there's, people are thinking about better solutions now. Um, and also, so there's things like, um, there's a lot of new hardware things that are coming out that really help the entire cloud space. And also people think like, okay, before I, I, I deployed to here because everybody else did. And so I'm going to deploy to here and this is why I trust them. But really like the, the crypto space is all about like kind of trustless stuff. So I don't really want to have to trust just because of the name brand or something. Um, and so there are new protocols coming out to, to allow you to deploy things and have confidence that it isn't being looked at or shut down. We also give a lot more options. So somebody like Equinix, they have really put a lot of thought into this stuff and they have a lot of options for you. Again, we make it easy to access those things so you don't just go with the default that everybody else uses because everybody else is using it. Let's talk about cost and control. 
Adam, what's your take on having a personal or private internet running your own mail servers uh, without having to worry about some hyperscaler? And also, if you can talk about the cost associated with it. Yeah, I think in the like kind of private internet slash like this is a thing that I kind of have agency over and control. Like for me, like for instance, I don't. I choose not to have uh, things delivered from 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 Amazon, for instance, because I don't want to. Okay, because they're for various reasons. I, I choose to try to not use that. Um, I don't, you know, that's difficult to do right now uh, for for cloud computing. And so for me, when I'm tinkering with something, when I want to have owner, feel like I have ownership with some, up over something, a mail server, for instance, um, to be forced into using an organization that I may not agree with is uh, is a buzzkill. Let's just say it's something that it doesn't have that same so it's that same feeling. And so with all these Web three technologies, Web three infrastructure options out there. Um, it changes that aspect of it. It really makes it more of a personal internet again. Yeah, and I think, you know, to build on what Adam is saying, it's about the offering, right? And I think that what Equinix Metal does really well is we give that private internet feel and service to our customer, regardless of if they need to run a handful of servers or if they need to run a thousand servers. And we also apply component pieces that support that infrastructure as they build it out. And that's, I think, the return to the original thought of the internet, right? This private experience where, you know, you're compensated for your slice of the web, but you're also building something that helps and aids in the collective. And I think that traditionally what's happened with legacy technology is the cost has been prohibitive. You've not been able to build solutions as you see fit because the cost keeps ballooning. And by having the ability to get what you need, and not just what's offered. You're really able to construct the world as you see fit and engage with your tool and your product and your customers as it best suits you. And I think that that is one of the philosophical components of Web3 that companies such as Equinix Metal and companies such as Akash make a priority for in the offering we give our customers is we actually really respect that autonomy and we respect that independence and we want to provide a strong foundation for you to build the world you wish to see. Adam, Grace, thank you so much for joining me today and share great insights about Web3. I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me and for the great, great conversation. Bye. Thank you.